students. And uh, we've known Bruce, he's been here a few times, but of course you've heard the story how uh, his brother Sammy got saved years ago and started praying for him and asking prayer for Bruce. And I think it lasts over about 20 years. 21 years. 21 years of faithful prayer. And of course Bruce here got saved and, and God's been using him across the country, both of them actually. And I thought it'd be good to have them both come and be part of our conference this year. And they've been a blessing so far. So open your hearts to what the Lord would have for you today. And I believe you, you won't leave uh, disappointed at all. So guys, that's all yours. Thank you, Pastor. We're good to go. All right. Uh, turn your Bibles, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Brother Sammy got saved and I got saved and God changed our life. If you're here and you're saved today, God changed your life as well. Amen? Amen. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, the Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things or become new. Sammy, would you pray for us, brother? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gift of a new day. We thank you that your mercies are new every morning, that your grace is sufficient, and your love is everlasting. And we come today to worship you, for thou art worthy, O Lord, receive glory, honor, and power, for thou hast created all things. And we just want to say thank you. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. Thank you for the gift of salvation, Lord. Thank you for the gift of family. Thank you for the family of God here in this place. Thank you for the privilege of being able to serve you and to know you and to love you, because we do. We commit ourselves in this service to, to you, Lord, as we share your story of what you've done in our lives, and we give you the praise for it. Thank you for the song we just sang. What a wonderful way to begin, to God be the glory. May everything we do, say, and sing today bring you pleasure and bring you glory. We pray for every person here this morning, young and old, and ask that you will speak as only you can. And we acknowledge that without you, we can do nothing. But we thank you that we can do all things through Christ. So we commit ourselves to you. And we love you, Lord, and we need you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now and then an old friend of mine I've not seen for some time Will stop by and ask me Hey, where you been? What's on your mind? They wonder why I'm not drinking And still painting this old town red I tell them I'm serving Jesus now and the old man is dead. The man you see before you may look a lot the same, may wear the same clothes, have the same old name. But you're looking on the outside could see inside instead you would see a brand new man cause the old man is dead you see according to the word of God in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 the Bible says therefore if any man be in Christ he's a new creature old things are passed away behold all things are become new To live such a wicked life I had no hope inside I was lost in darkness Searching for the light Then one night in a little church After hearing what the preacher said I gave my life to Jesus the old man was dead. The man 
and you see before you may look a lot the same may wear the same clothes have the same old name but you're looking on the outside could see inside instead you would see a brand new man as the old man is dead you're still looking on the outside you could see inside instead you would see a brand new true in your life but it wasn't always that way with us and as we begin to tell his story our journey began in LA Lower Aberdeen and um, <laughs> we grew up there in the country and um, we had a wonderful growing up period for a time things got rough later but growing up we were had a garden you know I remember thinking that you know my dad plants enough food to feed all the starving people in the world and we have to plant it, hoe it, weed it, pick it, pluck it, and then eat it, all right? And um, I remember telling Dad, I said, Dad, you know, they have grocery stores and they have multiple options in these grocery stores. They're air conditioning and you don't have to do all this. We could be doing some other things. He said, get back out in the field, boy. I mean, that didn't, that didn't help at all. <laughs> Grew up with horses and just a lot of experiences growing up, but I know some of you are not gonna be able to relate to this because you probably woke up this morning Walked over to the mirror and just paused and said, no, I'm not going to touch it. Perfection. I, everything's good. <laughs> well, it wasn't that way for me when I was growing up. You know, I tell people, look, you're skinny, short, your last name is Fry, and you have buck teeth, and your mama shaves your head. Welcome to my world, you know. And uh, I'm telling you, I had some buck teeth now. I had, I had real buck teeth. In fact, uh, my mother didn't have to worry about me kissing girls. Why is that? Because they're afraid I'd knock them out with my teeth before I'd get there with my lips. I mean, <laughs> it was bad. I could eat an apple in one bite. You think I'm kidding. I used to lay in bed at night and push on my teeth with my hands. My hand would fall asleep. I would switch hands. Then that hand would fall asleep. Then I would fall asleep, swallow my hand, choke to death. Not really, but anyway. <laughs> and my daughter, many years, uh, several years ago, found my high school annual, and she was looking at my picture and my annual, and she said, Dad, what's wrong with your mouth? And I said, what do you mean what's wrong with my mouth? She said, it looks like you have two lips. And I said, well, Brody, I didn't smile in pictures because I had buck teeth. And uh, thank God for braces. That's what I say. I'm, I wanted braces. I was excited about braces. Make it hurt, Doc. Give the world some relief, okay? <laughs> and um, I wasn't a sight for sore eyes. I was a sight to make your eyes sore. But, you know, and then when Mom shaved our head, she bought these horse shears so she could save money you know, to cut the horses, she said, I can save money on haircuts. She didn't know about styling. She had one style, take it all off. So here I am, like I said, buck teeth, bald head, short, skinny. My last name is Fry, and it was, uh, it was painful, okay? <laughs> if you need some tissue, we'll go ahead and cry together right now and get it over <laughs> with. But anyway, well, that, you know, you grow up and things move on. And, and uh, you know, I remember I didn't have any time for girls, ladies, nothing personal or anything. But in third grade, I had a traumatic experience. Joyce Cummings. Now get this. I had buck teeth. I was bald head. I was short. I was skinny. And mom cut all my hair off. And she told me she's going to give me a kiss right on the face on the playground. Joyce Cummings. And I said, Joyce, you're not going to do that. She said, yes, I am. I said, no, you're not. She said, yes, I am. She said, why can't I kiss you? I said, because you have cooties. She said, what's that? I don't know, but you have them. Okay. <laughs> and I, don't, I didn't know about the coronavirus then. But, but anyway, and I, I took off running. And, you know, all the girls in the class were bigger than me, taller than me, faster than me. She tackled me on that playground, gave me a kiss right on my face, and buck teeth, little boy Sammy went to the bathroom and put my head under the spigot and just let it run for about 20 minutes. I mean, <laughs> it, it was one of those things. But uh, later on, I got interested in young ladies and met a young lady named Sandra Cheatham. And um, we knew you had a relationship for several months. I talked about that last night. Enough said about that. But... Uh, 
she said, I had enough for you, and I understand that was a really wise decision on her part at that point in my life, I can tell you. But I remember going to church. My grandmother went to the church that Sandra went to because we went to different schools, and I could only see her on Saturdays at the skating rink, and so I suddenly got interested in church. Now, growing up, I had joined the church. I'd gotten baptized. Why did you do that, Sammy? Because my mother told me it's time for you to join the church. <laughs> yes, ma'am. And I just did it out of obedience to her. I was lost as a goose flying backwards in a hailstorm. That's what I was. And now I like what Billy Sunday said. Now I'm so saved I could swing over hell on a rotten grapevine singing Blessed Assurance all the way. But it uh, wasn't so then. It was just a religious exercise that I went through. And, uh, but then we, stopped, we went to church when we were young for a number of years. But then we stopped going all together. Don't ask me why. My, we just didn't go until I met Sandra Cheatham. And I found out where she went to church. Grandma went there. And we would sit in church. And the preacher would say, hey, I'm going to go a little past 12 today. I said, that's okay, preacher. Preach on. I love church. Because I'm sitting in the back row holding her hand. I wouldn't let go. I'm telling you what, I was in love, you know. <laughs> and um, it was awful. But anyway, some people say, I fell in love. I said, yeah, get ready to get hurt, okay. If that's all you got. If you fall in love, you're likely to fall and get hurt at some point in time. Love is certainly a whole lot more than an emotion, right, a feeling. You better have more than that. And um, so, you know, we would sit there, and, and, and it was wonderful when she was there. But when I would go with my grandmother and she wasn't there, church was painful. Sorry, folks. I didn't understand a thing the preacher was saying, like a foreign language. I was so bored, it seemed like it was last forever, so I would count lights, and I'd get bored with that. Then I'd start counting the bricks. And you ever try to count bricks in church? I always lose my place. And I had this terrible temptation to go up and take a magic marker and mark them so I wouldn't lose my place because I had to keep having to start over and then look at the stained glass windows and think, well, I'd like to bust them out and watch them try to put them back together. I mean, I was awful, you know. But uh, after she broke up with me, no more church, and I ended up going to college. But in high school, I was a commander of an ROTC unit. Phil, we talked about that last night, but I was nominated to the Air Force Academy, and I wanted to be a pilot. That was my dream. Actually, my dream was to be an astronaut, but they told me, because they detected a heart murmur, and said that I could not be a pilot because of that, and I walked away from an education. I had a congressional appointment at the Air Force Academy, foolishly, lost, 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 dumb, um, no wisdom, and dumb. and then I really began to struggle, because that was my dream. That was all I ever wanted to do, and it was a painful time. So life took a downward turn and graduated from college, worked for a couple of years in the, the field of psychology. I worked in an inpatient mental health unit. After two years, I realized I wasn't getting any better, so it was time for me to move on <laughs> from that. And um, not only that, I didn't have any real answers um, for the people with needs in their life. And, and Carrie, I want to thank you. I read your track this morning. I read every track that you folks wrote in your track rack, and I have a young lady that needs to hear your story, and if, with your permission, she may call you, because she called me, and, and I've been trying to help her and my wife, my wife and I together, so it was so precious to read, but in the context of that unit, I didn't have answers, and the doctors didn't have answers. They had medication, and I am not opposed to medication. Don't misunderstand me. But to just do medication without dealing with heart issues is not enough. We're spiritual beings. We're made by God for God. And we need to deal with that, that, that heart dynamic. So I decided after, after working a couple years there, very disillusioned, that I wanted to, to pursue a career in entertainment. I decided to go to Aspen, Colorado first. John Denver was a huge megastar then. You young people have to Google him. Some of us know him. And I went out to Aspen and washed dishes in a Chinese restaurant with my brother Dale and skied and played music in clubs. I had the privilege, to, and I don't know if you call it a privilege, to meet and play with John Denver's band, develop relationships with them. And um, boy, did they love their cocaine, the All-American Band. But um, that was, went very well. I was just testing myself because I was going to either pursue a career in movies or music. I come home, had already decided to sell books door to door. Uh, because a friend of mine that had gone to University of North Carolina, had done very well, and he recruited me to do that. And I said, well, if I'm going to pursue a career in entertainment, I'm going to move to Hollywood, California, 
or New York City because I pretty much decided that I don't have the, Bruce, the, the voice that Bruce has, but I can act and I've done some drama and things and I decided it was going to be the movie route. So uh, I was, needed to make money. I needed, so I was committing this summer to making money and to earning enough to make this big move and pursue this career um, really out of a, a spirit of pride. It's disappointing and sad to say my desire, my dream, if I can't be a pilot and be an astronaut, I want to do something so that everybody will know my name. It's amazing how God can change a heart because today my desire is I want everybody to know his name. Amen. I'm really not important. I'm just a little drop in the bucket of eternity. And, uh, but I'm out in Sweetwater, Texas, selling books door to door. I work six days a week. 12, 14 hours a day sometimes, knocking on doors. And several things happened. When, when I'd gone on my way to Colorado, to back up just for a moment, I was driving across Colorado, and my brother Dale was with me on this trip, just thinking about my life. 24 years old, why am I here? What's it all about? You know, in and out of relationships, the party lifestyle, the music, the theater, and all of these things, but I was so empty inside, and maybe you understand what I was feeling. I didn't have the answers to the questions I was asking. I looked at my brother Dale and I said, Dale, do you believe in God? And he looked at me and he, he didn't say a word. It was like, you are talking about God. He was he didn't say a word and I didn't say any more. And then when we were in Aspen, um, I was skiing one day on one of those mountains in the Rocky Mountains. And Dale, my brother, disappeared skiing in a cloud. Literally, the cloud, we were so high that there was a cloud below us. He disappeared into a cloud. And I'm standing there looking across the glory and the beauty of the, God's creation. And out loud, I said this. Yes, I believe there's a God, but I don't know you. You know, the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament showeth forth his handiwork. I was seeing the fingerprints of God, and I just at that moment I said, Yes, there's a God. And I was in a bar one night, and a fellow asked me to play a song. He said, Will you play Amazing Grace when you go back up to play? And I was so, con I was under conviction during that time, and I didn't play that song. And I remember that night going back to where we were staying looking at the stars, thinking, if there's no God, if Jesus is not real, why was I so uncomfortable when he asked me to play that song? Well, the reality is Jesus is real. Mm -hmm. And now he's my best friend. I love Jesus Christ. But later that summer in Texas, here's a young man struggling, full of questions, full of doubts, empty inside. And I was at this one person's house, and I'm getting ready to leave after presenting my books. And uh, this man said, Sammy, can I ask you a question? I said, certainly. He said, if you died right now, would you go to heaven or hell? You know, up until that point in my life, and from that point to this day, I've never had anybody else ask me that question. And I stood there, very uncomfortable, asking myself, why did I stop here? This is not what, I didn't want to get into all this. But I said, I'm going to tell him the truth. I said, sir, I don't know. And he said, son, if you don't know, I could probably tell you. And then he said, son, are you a sinner? My first thought popped in my head was, he must know me. <laughs> exactly what I thought. And he said, son, I know the answer to that. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You're a sinner. He said, do you understand the penalty for sin is death? The wages of sin is death. Your memory verse it really struck me when you mentioned that, Pastor. It's a great verse to memorize. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I hope you never get weary of hearing that wonderful verse. Words of hope, words of power, words of love, words of mercy, words of forgiveness, thank, words of salvation. He said, son, Jesus loves you and he died for you and he rose from the dead for you. And he said, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Wouldn't you like to call on the Lord right now? He got on his knees in his living room, scared me half to death. He wanted me to get down there with him. The only prayer I ever knew was, now lay me down to sleep, pray the Lord my soul to keep, 
If I should die before I wake, pray the Lord my soul to take. And I lay there afraid to go to sleep when I was a kid, you know, after praying that prayer. And he prayed. I kept one eye open because I thought he, I said, this guy's crazy. He might hit me in the head with something. I just, what is going on? I just want to get out. I, I, I was so nervous. And I went to the, after he said amen, I went to the door ready to run out. And his wife came from the kitchen. Talk about the power of prayer. She said, Sammy, I've called some people at the church, a church just like this, with people just like you that love God and love people. I can sense his presence in you and through you as you've been so kind and hospitable. She said, they're praying for you. And I felt at that moment, I thought I was going to start crying because I was just all of a sudden, Whoa, wow. And I said, thank you. And I ran out. I, I did. I got behind a mimosa tree, and I cried for about eight, ten minutes, and I got myself together, and I made a decision. I'm going to stay away from these Christian people. <laughs> that was my decision. I said, I'll tell you what, you talk to them for ten minutes, they're praying for you, next thing I know, I'm crying behind a tree in the middle of nowhere, and I don't even know why. <laughs> I'm losing my mind. That's how I felt. But the question that was so penetrating, basically he was saying, young man, have you ever been born again? And, you know, I could ask you, if you died right now, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Have you ever been born again? Well, like my brother, I grew up in the same house, had the same mama. And one day I was running through the kitchen getting ready to head to my bedroom to get something. And my mom said, Bruce, stop. I want to talk to you a minute. And I said, okay. I said, what is it, mom? She said, Bruce, she said, you're 13 years old and you know right from wrong, don't you, son? And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, well, I think it'd be a good thing for you to join the church. And I said, okay. I said, what do you want me to do then? And she said, well, first thing I want you to do is to read this. And she gave me a gospel tract about a 12-year-old boy who had trusted Christ as his Savior. I went back in my bedroom. I read it. I got very emotional after I read it. And I went back into the kitchen. And, and I said, Mama, I think I'd like to do what this little boy did. And she said, okay, I'll call the preacher. So the pastor came by our house uh, later on that night. And he and I went into the living room to talk. Now, I don't remember what we talked about because I just cried the whole time I was with the man. And um, if he opened the Bible and showed me Scripture, I don't remember him doing that. If I prayed a prayer from these lips to trust Christ as my Savior, I don't remember doing that either. They said that I did. And so the next Sunday came, and I was sitting way back in the back of the church, and they had an invitation. They called my name. I came forward. I got baptized and I joined the church and for years of my life I thought that if I died I would go to heaven because I prayed a prayer, got baptized and joined the church. But prayer, baptism and church membership didn't leave heaven and die on a cross. Jesus Christ did that. So for all those years my trust was misplaced. Now I don't blame my mom. I don't blame the preacher because salvation is from your heart to God's ear because only God can see your heart. My microphone just fell down here in the woods. And I could tear up a log chain. <laughs> there we go. Sorry about that. And so after I got baptized, I just went right back to being the same little old brat I always was. I, I could lie to my mom and daddy, not blink an eye. It didn't bother me a bit. Why? Because I never truly got saved. I made a po false profession of faith. But I thought that I was a Christian. As a matter of fact, my band members and I, back in the day, before we'd do a show, sometimes we'd go and eat dinner. They always knew that I was going to pray for the meal because I was very religious. I was religious, but I was lost. And my prayers were not very good. I would say, God, you know, me and the guys, are, we're going to go out and, you know, be partying and stuff tonight, so watch out over us. I was asking God to overlook my sin. He can't do that. And so... I had God had given me the talent for music, and so I had always wanted to be a star. That that was my dream from being a little kid. And uh, back when I was younger, I would put a stick around my neck and a string and pretend that I was singing in front of thousands of people. And then years later, that became a reality for me. All of a sudden, I'm not standing in front of a mirror with a fake guitar. I'm standing in front of thousands of people with a real guitar. They're screaming my name. They're wanting more. And... Uh, I, no matter how much money I made or how many thousands of people that came to hear me sing, like my brother, I was empty inside. And I got an independent record deal with Tone King Records there in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, my band and I just made our first CD, and we were just doing really good. 
but it was not enough for me. I wanted more. So I had a meeting with my band members, and I told them, I said, look, guys, I want to go to Nashville, Tennessee. I want to get a major record deal. I want to bust with my name on the side of it. Because back then, it was all about me. I just wanted everybody to know who I was. And so uh, <clears throat> my band members didn't want to leave Raleigh, North Carolina. And I said, well, if you're not going to go with me, I'm going to go by myself because I want this record deal. And they said, Bruce, there's no way you would leave all of this. We've got it made. And I said, yeah, we may have it made, but I want more. And I left on April Fool's Day of 1990, moved to Nashville, Tennessee. And I'll be honest with you, I was such a cocky rooster. I thought I'll be here two or three months. I'll have a record deal and be off and running. But the months turned into years. And I was there from 1990 to 1997. I knocked on every door, played every club, did, it, did everything humanly possible to get a record deal. And I still didn't have a record deal. I looked in my checkbook one day. I had $43 left in it. And I was 43 years old, broke and tired and discouraged. And that's when I started thinking, what is life really all about? Uh, God, did you give me this talent so I could be a star? Is there something else I'm supposed to do with my life? I started having these thoughts. And so while all this was going on, I met two men, and they told me they thought I had what it took to get a record deal, and they wanted to help me, and I told them I needed some help. And uh, they said, well, the first thing you need to do, you need to record four songs. It's going to probably cost the neighborhood of around $12,000 to do it. And I said, guys, I got $43 left of my name. I don't have that kind of money. And they said, we know you don't, but we do. And if you let us be your management company, we'll put this money behind you and help you get this deal. And so I made a deal with them. You help me get a record deal, and then I'll sign any contract you want me to sign. And then a week before we were going into the studio, they called me on the phone. They said, our lawyer said, if we don't get your name on a contract right now, we should back out of this deal. And I said, well, that was not our deal. And they said, well, that's the deal now. Take it or leave it. And I hung the phone up on him. I said, forget it. I called my producer, told him what had happened. And he said, well, you want me to cancel everything? And I said, no, sir. Our little mama worked at a bank back in Aberdeen, North Carolina. And I called her on the phone. I said, mama, I need to borrow $12,000. Can you help me? And she said, yeah, I can help you, but you have to pay it back. I said, yeah, I know. I didn't tell my mother that I was thousands and thousands of dollars in debt already. And I borrowed this money on top of that, went into the studio, did the CD, and my producer took a liking to me that week. And he said, Bruce, I'm going to help you. I know everybody in Nashville. I'll take this CD around and see what they say. And a week later, he called me on the phone. They said, Bruce, they like it, and they want to hear you do a showcase. Now, when you do a showcase, you have to rent a building, the lights, put the band together, give them free food and uh, drinks and stuff like that. And every time I did one of those showcases, it would cost me several thousand dollars. And I'm thinking, where am I going to get the money to do that? I can't borrow any more money. I, I sold my Harley-Davidson motorcycle. I sold a bunch of things trying to keep you know, my head out of the water. And then I remembered I had a comic book collection in my closet I'd had since I was a little boy. And I loved those books. I had been collecting them all my life. I had Spider-Man number one, the Avengers, the X-Men, all these Marvel movies that are out. I had all those comic books and had them in the acid-free back and in the boxes. And, and I'm thinking, record deal comic books, what do I want more? And I wanted that record deal so bad, I sold my whole comic book collection for $4,500. And then several years ago, I found out that somebody got a million dollars for Spider-Man number one. I had that book. I had the Hulk number one through six when he's gray before he turned green. I mean, I had some old comic books, and I shouldn't have done it, but I went on the Internet to see how much that number one Hulk was worth, $49,000. <laughs> and before I pass out on you, let's just move on, all right? <laughs> but God was, was removing the idols of my heart out of my life. I had been dating a girl for five years. She and I broke up. And so I lost my motorcycle, I lost my girlfriend, and I lost my comic books. And I went in to do this showcase, and when you do a showcase, you have 30 minutes to try to win the hearts of these people. I, I sang, I entertained, did everything that I could do. And when it was over, I stood at the door and I shook their hand, I thanked them for coming. And this is what they said to me that day. They said, Bruce, you're a good singer, you're a good songwriter, you had good stage presence, we enjoyed the show, but you're just not what we're looking for right now. And it crushed me. Later on that night, when I got back to my apartment, I fell on my knees beside my bed because I always believed in God. James 2.19 says, Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. And on my knees that night, I didn't ask God to save me. I didn't ask for forgiveness. This is what I said. I said, God, I thought you gave me this talent so I could be rich and famous. If that's not it, I said, why am I here, God? What is my purpose for living? I really wanted to know. 
And then I say, God, I'm broke. I've never been broke like this in my life. And, and uh, I don't know if I can ever get out of debt. Could you help me with that? Because if there's something you want me to do, I want to do it, but I can't think. I've got so much debt piled on me. That was my prayer to God. Cried myself to sleep, woke up the next day, and I went and bought a Bible for $8 and started reading the Word of God. But instead of doing what the Word of God says, repentance toward God, faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'd always done things my way. So I got out a piece of paper. I said, I'm going to stop cussing. I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to stop drugs. I'm going to stop partying. I'm going to quit doing all these bad things because I thought if I could just clean myself up that I could win favor with God, get my record deal, go to heaven, and live a wonderful life. But I was trying to work my way to God. And the Bible says, Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saves us. Amen. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, for by grace are you saved through faith. That's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I was such a cocky rooster. If I could have worked my way to heaven, I'd have bragged about it when I got there. But guess what? I couldn't keep my list. Some days I drink, some days I wouldn't, some days I cuss, some days I wouldn't. So I was just having a hard, hard time. And so during this time, I uh, was <clears throat> did this record deal and didn't get the record deal. And then I got a check in the mail from ASCAP. ASCAP collects your money if you're on television or radio. And I'd done the Matlock television show back in the early 90s. They paid me to do that show. I never expected another dime. But they used two of my songs on there, so I got a royalty check. And the check came from Denmark and Canada. I did the Matlock television show in Wilmington, North Carolina. I said, well, this is weird. So I took my check down to ASCAP, showed it to the lady, and I said, you people sent me this money. I'm glad to get it, but I don't know why I got it. And she said, well, are you a member with us? I said, yes. She said, are your songs copywritten? Are they cataloged? Are they published? And I said, no. She said, then we don't know you a dime. I said, why did I get that check? She said, I have no idea. In my heart that day, I thought God sent me that check. Then she punched some numbers in the computer, and she said, oh, my goodness. She said, Bruce, there's a lot of money in here for you, but you can't touch it. I said, why not? She said, because you don't have your paperwork in order. So she helped me get all of that in order. She said, now, Bruce, we'll submit this, and you're going to get some money. I just don't know how much. In January of 1998, I got a check in the mail from ASCAP. They went all the way back to the first time they aired that show and paid me up to that date. And it was for thousands of dollars. And usually, if Bruce Fry had money in his pocket, whoo, life's a gas, everything's great. Because I love money. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Money's not evil, but the love of it is. I wanted to be rich and famous. But all of a sudden, God had taken my love of money out of my heart. I held that check up to heaven, and I said, God, thank you. This is really going to help me. But why am I still so miserable? And then the second thing that happened there in January of 1998, after I got that check, there's a gospel tract out there on my table. Many of you have seen it. There's a picture of me and Hank Williams Jr. on the front. I'm the ugly woman on the right. My hair was down to here, I had the earrings and all the stuff I wore back in the day. And I didn't have a hair problem, I had a heart problem. And once my heart got right, then my hair got right, amen? And so uh, <clears throat> the owner of that club where that picture was taken was on his way to work January the 21st of 1998, 4.30 in the afternoon, two men jumped him and robbed him and killed him. I went to his funeral a few days later. It was a graveside funeral, and a Catholic priest was performing that funeral, and he kept saying things like this. Well, our friend was not a church-going man. He was not a religious man, but he was a nice man. He did a lot of good things for people. He had such a good heart. I'm sure he's in a better place. But I had been reading the Bible where it says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. You read down to verse 12, it says, there's none that doeth good, no, not one. And that doesn't mean you can't be nice to people or do good things. It means your goodness is never going to get you to God. That's why you need his goodness, his righteousness applied to your life. Then he uh, talked about him having such a good heart. And I thought I had a good heart. But Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And it was at that funeral God revealed to me personally that I was not as good as I thought I was, and my heart was wicked. And I went by his grave, and everybody took a shovel full of dirt and threw it in the hole. And I'd never done that, but I didn't want to be an oddball, so I took my turn. And when I threw my shovel full of dirt down in that hole, I wondered where my friend was and where I was going. I got back to my apartment that night. I opened my Bible and I said, God, I'm not reading enough. I'm not praying enough. I'm not keeping my list good enough. And I was so upset. That's when I called my brother Sammy on the phone. I knew my brother loved God. I knew that he was a Christian. And I said, Sammy, my, my career's at a standstill. And my friend was just murdered. And I'm just having a hard time. I've been reading the Bible. I'm trying to keep this list and just want to call and talk to you. And Sammy prayed with me over the phone. And 
A few days later, he sent me a letter in the mail, and it was like a hug from North Carolina to Tennessee. And in that letter, Sammy said, Bruce, I love you, but I don't love you like God loves you. And he put some little chick comic book gospel tracks in there because he knew I was a comic book kid. And, and in that letter, he shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I was doing all of this stuff. And my band members and I played in Wintergreen, Virginia every year. It was an annual event. I would uh, come to North Carolina, pick them up, and then we'd drive to Wintergreen and uh, play from uh, Tuesday through Saturday. And uh, I picked my band members up, and we played all week long. And this, I was trying to keep my list. My band members were partying, and I was, you know, trying to do good and be a good boy. And I did pretty good all week. <laughs> and uh, Saturday morning, I got up early. I drove to Raleigh, sang one song at a friend of mine's wedding. And um, after I sang that song, I was packing up my guitar, and the preacher that performed that wedding walked up to me. And he said, Bruce, he said, uh, I enjoyed your singing. Have you ever been born again? And that was the question that he asked me. It was late at night in the summer, he was waiting for a man. Master of the Jews, yet he was searching. The law he taught had never satisfied. Nicodemus came and slowly bowed his reading. As he said, he quietly wondered where to start. Nowhere else to turn, his teacher came to learn. Not knowing that the Lord had read his heart, and he said, We know thou art a teacher from heaven sent to man. No man can do these miracles except God be with him. Jesus paused and then he answered the question on his mind. If you want to see God's kingdom, ye must be born again. Born again of the water and the spirit. Like the wind, you may not see it, but ye must be born again. Are you willing now to listen? To the word of God this day There are angels all around us For godly folks have prayed Could there be a Nicodemus Listening today And if you want to see God's kingdom You must be born again Born again Of the water and the spirit like the wind, you may not see it, but you must be born again. Born again of the water and the Spirit. Like the wind, you may not see it, but you must be born again. And he must be born again. Born again. After my time in Sweetwater, Texas, there, and those folks, several folks have witnessed to me and shared with me, um, I met a young preacher, like this young preacher, with a heart for God and a heart for people. I called him up. We met at his church. He took me to a Holiday Inn. We had a glass of tea, and I had a yellow pad full of questions. I would be embarrassed for you to know some of the questions I asked that preacher. But he was so kind. He was so patient. At the end of our question-answer session, he answered every question right from the Word of God. One time, I said to him, Preacher, that's what I thought you'd say, and I think that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. He said, I understand why you'd feel that way. What's your next question? At the end of my questions and answers, he said, Sammy, you've had some great questions. He said, but I believe that your greatest need in your life is simply that you need to be born again. Except you be born again, you shall not see the kingdom of God. He prayed for me, I left his office, and I went to that little one-room efficiency apartment where I was living during my book-selling time, 
And I fell to my knees, and there, alone with God, I cried out to the Lord and placed my faith and trust in Jesus Christ to be my Savior. I don't remember what I said, I, but I remember what I was feeling. I felt so dirty because I was dirty. And I knew he is so holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And I just cried out to him, blessed are the poor in spirit, bankrupt beggars. That's what I was, a bankrupt beggar that day. Mm -hmm. And he met me at my point of need, and he saved me, forgave me. It was like the world lifted off of me, and people asked me, Sammy, how come you're so sure you're saved? I said, well, number one, I was there when it happened, you know? <laughs> and, uh, but even more importantly than that, my life really began to change. And you know, amazing um, to think that uh, during that time after I came home, I began to be so burdened for my family, and I would go to this old barn in the back of our property and pray for Bruce and Dale and others that I love, like some of you, you have people you love and are burdened for, and I wrote a song called Someone, never realizing that one day, this song I wrote with Bruce in mind, uh, that one day we would be singing it together. And he would be singing the lead, the lead. We serve a mighty God, folks. Don't give up. Keep praying. Someone has a daddy, and they love their daddy so. The time is steady passing, and daddy's getting old. Daddy wants you to listen, for the time is running out. It could be this very hour. Daddy, won't you listen now? Are you someone, someone's been praying for? Someone loves you enough to take the time To fall upon their knees Praying, Father, won't you please Find a way before too late for my daddy to believe you may have a brother and only God can know the hours you spend praying for the brother you love so. You may be that brother thinking time is on your side. Your soul will be required of you who knows this very night. And you may have a daughter or a son that you love so. And they both have long forgotten the faith their mother sold. You may be that son or daughter and you wander far away. The time has come to now return, now before too late. And are you someone, someone's been praying for? Someone loves you enough to take the time. Fall upon their knees, praying, Father, won't you please find a way before too late for my family to believe? Won't you find a way before too late for that someone to I had no idea that my brother was praying for me and all these other people were praying for me around the country and so all this was coming to a head and after I talked to that preacher after that wedding and he asked me how if I'd ever been born again I told him I said preacher I thought I did that when I was a 13 year old boy I said uh, I'm not sure if I'm saved or not but I'm doing the best I can he said Bruce you can do the best you can and die and go to hell God sent his best for you. You need to trust Christ as your Savior. Amen. And I said, yeah, I've been hearing about that. And so he shared his testimony with me. He was a preacher uh, who used to be a singer, and uh, he told me his, his story, prayed for me, and I drove back to Wintergreen, and my band members gathered around me that night, and they said, Bruce, you've been here with us all week. You're not partying with us. Don't you love us anymore? I said, yeah, I love you guys, but I'm trying to change my life. Did you hear what I said? I'm trying to change my life, but I couldn't change it. So I told him, I said, well, for our last night together, I'll have one drink to celebrate our last night, but don't ask me to have any more. And they said, okay. So I had one, which led to another, which led, next thing you know, I'm right back in the middle of the muck and mire I'm trying to get out of. And that Sunday morning, I woke up and I said, God, I don't want to do this anymore, but I can't quit. 
And I said, God, please help me. Sammy had invited me to come in here and preach. He knew I was coming home to North Carolina. So I drove all my band members to Raleigh. Three and a half hours, dropped them off. Then I drove another hour or so to my brother's church. And when I got there, it was different than this church, a real long shotgun church, and they were all standing up singing a song because I got there late and I slipped in the back hoping nobody would see me. Sammy preached and then had an invitation. And during the invitation, he said these words. He said, if you're here and you're not sure that if you died right now that you go to heaven, he said, why don't you just step out of your seat, walk down here, we'll open the word of God and show you how you can be born again into God's family by putting your trust and faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection for your salvation. Won't you come? And I'm back there in the back, and my hair's hanging in my face. I'm weeping and I'm crying. And under my breath, I'm begging Sammy to stop the invitation. I'm saying, brother, I can't walk down there. I'm Bruce Fry. I'm the hometown boy that went to Nashville to be a star. Everybody knows me. I had so much pride in my heart that I couldn't move. And then he left the pulpit area and walked down front. And he said, look, it's late. It's time to go home. But I believe there's somebody here who needs Christ. And I don't know who you are. But we're going to extend this invitation and give you time to come. And I said, no, don't extend it. End it. Let me out of here. And finally he realized nobody was coming forward. And he said, well, we're going to end the service, but if you're here and you're not sure heaven's your home, would you at least raise your hand and let me pray for you? I'm way back in the back, and I raised my hand, and he said, I see your hand. I'm going to pray for your soul, not knowing it was me. And he prayed for me, and the next day I was getting ready to head back to Nashville, and he called me on the phone and said, can I buy you some lunch before you leave? And I said, sure. And we sat down to eat our lunch, and I, I told him, you know, I didn't tell him I was in church the night before, but as soon as he started talking to me, the tears started coming again. I was under deep conviction, never even heard that word. And, and uh, the food got there, and I was crying so hard I couldn't eat. And I looked around, and I said, Sammy, I'm embarrassed. Can we just go outside? And we went and sat down in his car. He opened up the word of God, and he shared the sweet gospel of Jesus Christ with me. And he shared some beautiful verses with me. He said, Bruce, he said, do you realize that you're a sinner? Could you admit to God that you're a sinner? And I said, sure, Sammy, I know I'm a sinner. And he said, that's right, because the Bible says all of sin and come short of the glory of God. He said, uh, do you realize because you're a sinner that you deserve to go to hell? And I said, no, I, don't, I don't get that at all. I said, what are you talking about? And he showed me uh, Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. That word wages means payment. That word death is not just physical death, but spiritual death, separation from God forever in a place called the lake of fire. He said, Bruce, if you work a job and you get paid wages, you deserve those wages when you do the work, right? And I went, yes. He said, well, God says you deserve hell because you do the sin. And I said, well, I guess I deserve hell then, brother, because I've done the sin. He said, that's right. He said, you deserve hell. I deserve hell. If we all got what we deserve, we'd all be in hell right now. He said, but the verse doesn't end there. It says, but the, way, uh, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then he showed me Romans 10, 9, 9 and 10. Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved with the heart. Man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then he showed me Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He said, Bruce, would you like to bow your head and heart right here in this car, repent of your sins, and trust Christ as your Savior? And I said, no, Sammy, not right now. He said, okay. And he prayed for me. And I drove back to Nashville, and a week later, I was in my apartment one night. And at 12.30 in the morning, I fell on my knees beside my bed. And I looked up to heaven, and I said, God, I don't understand it all, but I'm miserable. And I know I need you in my life, and I'm sorry for everything I've ever done that was displeasing to you. God, please forgive me. And like Sammy, I felt like the Atlas, man. It was like the world just rolled off my back. I didn't know what that was then, but I know now it's the peace of God which passeth all understanding. And I looked at my clock, and it said 1230, and I reached over and grabbed a pen, and I wrote these words. I gave my heart and life to Jesus Christ at 1230 because I didn't want to forget it. And before I got off my knees, I looked up and I said, God, from this day forward, I'll go anywhere you want me to go. I'll do anything you want me to do. I got saved and surrendered my life to Christ. Crawled into the bed, still weeping, and I looked up to heaven, and I said, God, I hope I said all the right words to you. But I realize now it's not the words you say that save you, but the intent of your heart as you pray. As a 13-year-old boy, if I prayed a prayer, it went from my head out of my mouth and never changed my life. But 43 years old, from my heart out of my mouth, it changed everything about my life. I called Sammy to tell him what I had done after that. And uh, <laughs> he said that uh, he ran around the house and screamed and yelled. And, thanked God and fell on his face and prayed and then took another lap around his house and 
<laughs> then he called me back on the phone. He said, Bruce, when are you coming back to North Carolina? I said, this weekend. And so he and his wife and family took me out, bought me a steak dinner and a birthday cake to celebrate my born again birthday. And I'm getting ready to blow the candle out. And I looked at Sammy across the table and I said, Sammy, do you remember a couple of weeks ago on a Sunday night, you preached a message and had an invitation, extended the invitation. Do you remember that night, brother? And he said, Bruce, I'll never forget that night. I said, Sammy, that was me. That was your brother back there that raised his hand. He said, you got to be kidding me. This is the first song that I wrote after I got saved, simply entitled, That Was Me. A young man, a bottle in his hand. Not too long ago, that was me. Every night, Saturday night, dim motel lights. Not too long ago, that was me. That was me who had strayed, confused and afraid. Counting all the cost, that was me. Kneeling by his bedside, tears flowing from his eyes. Not too long ago, that was me. Jesus Christ led him in, giving all his sin. Not too long ago, that was me. That was me who had strayed, confused and afraid, counting all the cost. That was me. A friend approached and said, I heard you found the Lord. I replied he wasn't lost, that was me. My Savior wasn't lost, that was me. Well, that night at the dinner, at the end of the dinner, we're getting ready to leave, and I said, Brother, you know what? We're brothers twice. Uh, I said, you know, would it be something if one day we could write a song together called Brothers Twice and maybe even do a CD together, not realizing that God's ways are greater than our ways and he would allow us to go all over America sharing his story called Brothers Twice. We'll like to end with this song, Brothers Twice. Two, three, four. Out in the garden How to multiply shell and green peas. Seems like only last winter to me We were playing and fighting and skinning our knees Crawling like thieves down the hall Christmas Eve Playing songs on guitar mom and dad bought for me Now to God be the glory and to Him be all honor and all praise. In His love for the world, Jesus died on the cross. In mercy, He waited for two boys bold laws. Sweetwater, Texas, single and free. In a red heart, on a dream. Spoken law sinner fell down on me. Nashville, Tennessee, single and free In a rented apartment chasing a dream This broken law sinner fell down on his knees And cried out, dear Lord, please have mercy on me Now to God be the glory And to Him be all honor and all praise by trusting in Jesus, now brothers in Christ, washed in His blood, brothers twice. 
Now to God be the glory, and to Him be all honor and all praise. By trusting in Jesus now, brothers in Christ, washed in His blood, forgiven in love, born from above, brothers twice. You bow your head and close your eyes for a moment, please. With every head bowed and every eye closed, like my brother prayed for me over 23 years ago, I'd like to pray for you. If you're here and you're not 100% sure that if you died right where you're sitting, that you would go to heaven, would you let me pray for you? Nobody's looking, just between me and you and God. You say, Bruce, pray for me, because if I died right now, I'm not sure that heaven's my home. Would you please pray for me? Can I pray for you? Is there anyone like that this morning? If you raise your hand, I'll pray, and we'll move on. I promise, won't say a word. God bless you. Anybody else? Bruce, pray for me, because I'm not sure. If I died right this second, I'd go to heaven. Please pray for me. Anyone else at all? Father God in heaven, you've seen this hand that was raised, and you see the heart behind the hand. And there might have been another hand that I missed, but you didn't miss it. And so I pray during this invitation here in just a moment that they would come and let us open the Word of God and lead them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Many of you are here this morning, have people that you've been praying for for a long time. You say, Bruce, that's me. I have family members. I have friends that I'm praying for. Would you raise your hand? Is that you this morning? Father God in heaven, you see these hands. People who are burdened for family and friends. They're praying. They've been praying for quite some time. Lord, would you honor their prayers and would you save those that they're praying for? Would you stand with your head bowed and your eyes closed? And this is an invitation. If you raise your hand, you have somebody you've been praying for, why don't you come? Find you a place at an old-fashioned altar and renew your burden for those people. Would you come and pray? You raised your hand. You're not sure you're going to heaven. Oh, we would love to help you today. The devil does not want you to be saved, but God loves you so much. He wants you to know him as Lord and as Savior. Don't be like me. Leave your pride in your seat and come. Jesus said he'll give grace to the humble. He'll give grace to the humble. Would you come and let us help you? Lord, please use me. Everywhere I look, I see such need you they need please use me please send me please change me this hour cleanse make me holy anoint me with power to serve and obey bearing fruit every day the Lord that the on Lord the may heart. see your power, glorify if he is, your holy name. Open the door of your heart and allow him to come in. He said, Lord, if any man please send me, come to, to me, those I will know who need to know out. your saving power and your love. Only you can lift them up. Would you please come this morning? Lord, I'm Christ. willing. Please for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Please use me, please. He wants to save me. you today. Please change me this hour. He's speaking please to your heart. Would you come? Pastor. Anoint me with power to serve and obey, bearing fruit day by day. That the world may see your power, glorify your holy name. 
Lord, please use me. Lord, please change me. Lord, please send me. Heavenly Father, today we thank you for the word of God, the testimonies that we've heard that have touched our hearts. And, and Lord, I, I do thank you for just working in such miraculous ways in these testimonies. There's so many things that were mentioned that are encouraging in the fact that you never give up on people. And, and Lord, you, you encourage us to keep coming and keep sowing the seed, keep watering it. And Lord, in your time, you bring the fruit and we're so grateful for it. Lord, for those who do not know you as Savior, I pray that you have spoken to their hearts very clearly, that you will be continuing to work until the fruit comes. We pray for those of us here today that are saved, that we know people that we have been praying for in some cases uh, as long as what uh, as we have, as for, for, for years, for decades even, Lord. We pray for that uh, you would bring the fruit in your time and that you would be glorified. We praise the Lord for what has happened this morning. We look forward to the upcoming nights here. May you be glorified through.